Hello everybody and thank you for joining me for my presentation today as part of the Leica Biosystems Digital Pathology Virtual Summit. My name is Olga Colgan. Um, I am a marketing director with Leica Biosystems and I've worked in digital pathology for about 13 years now. And I'd like to speak to you today about getting your lab ready for digital pathology and providing some guidance on how to navigate your way to a successful deployment and some items to consider when going digital. So before we go into some of the detail around getting your lab ready, I thought it would be good to have a quick recap on some of the drivers that I've seen for adopting digital pathology. Um, and the one that tends to come top of the list is the increasing caseload and complexity that we're seeing globally. And this is tied to things like earlier detection methods, screening programs, biopsies, um, as well as the increasing number of biomarkers and subspecialization that we see throughout pathology. Um, and also globally, a trend where we see a declining number of practicing pathologists as pathologists are, are coming closer and closer to retirement age, which of course is putting um, additional pressure on the, the system. And really a drive to faster turnaround times, being able to get that patient diagnosis and the appropriate treatment plan started as soon as possible. And coupled with all of this, we see internationally um, healthcare improvement initiatives, whether these are done at a national level or a regional level, um, to standardize the quality of care for everybody. Um, and to give them access to expert diagnosis independent of their geographical location um, or the, the services that may be available to them locally. And really what this leads to is a, a situation whether it is by a, an individual organization's decision or it's mandated in a, a top-down type scenario that digital pathology is coming. Um, so it's how do we go about adopting digital pathology in the most stress-free and easy way possible. So when we look at, at implementing digital pathology, there are there's an impact across a, an organization, but it can kind of be attributed to three main groups of people. Uh, typically your laboratory and your laboratory staff, um, the IT department, and then uh, of course the people reviewing the slides and, and your pathologists. Um, so while these three groups of people are equally involved, I would say in any deployment or project to adopt digital pathology, I'm going to focus today predominantly on the impact for the, the lab and the laboratory staff. So I think one of the questions I get asked quite a lot is, so really where does digital pathology impact the, the lab? And I think quite often the response that I get or where people tend to go is, oh, that, that's what happens after cover slipping. Um, so instead of after cover slipping, putting my slides into flats and sending them out and delivering them to pathologists, I'll put them into a, a scanner and send them out. So effectively, you, you get something like this, where you get your scanners in after cover slipping. And I think this is the first of the potential pitfalls that I would like to, to highlight. Because really, if you look at implementing digital pathology, you have to take into consideration the whole process because it will impact. This is a bit of a paradigm shift and it will impact other areas of the lab. So rather than looking at it as a silo, as one step in the workflow that can be easily remove the, the microscope and put in scanners and screens, it's more of a holistic uh, adoption than, than that. So I think the first thing that people often think about is, well, what scanner do I need? Um, or how many scanners do I need? So 
in a, a kind of typical scenario, this is uh, the type of information that uh, I've seen or I've experienced over the years where you know, my lab creates 350 to 500 slides per day and which scanner is the, the best for, fit for my needs. Um, and typically there are two key factors that people will look at, the capacity of the scanner and in these three examples here, A, B and C, um, you know, 100, 200 or 500 slides and then the published scan speed. So the industry standard for measuring scan speed is typically a, a 15 millimeter by 15 millimeter sec uh, section. So looking at the, the different scan speeds, maybe from something like 45 seconds for A in this uh, case, right the way up to, to 95 seconds. And often this is kind of the, the basis where people start to make a decision about scanners or use these as the basic criteria. And I, I think really this is where a flag of caution goes up that this isn't necessarily all of the, the data that you'll need. And maybe I'm oversimplifying it here. So if we have a look, calculate your uh, scanning capacity. It's kind of a simple calculation that people will often use based on the number of slides. They say the capacity of the scanner, the manufacturer scan speed, and then the, the scanner throughput. So if we look at it, the, the simplest way you often see it done is the number of slides divided by the capacity of the scanner. That'll tell me the number of scanners I need. Or similarly, the manufacturer scan speed multiplied by my number of slides. That gives me my total time I will need for scanning. And then my total time for scanning divided by my lab work hours is going to tell me my number of scanners needed. And what I would say here is this is a dangerous way to think about it and be cautious because there are a number of factors that this type of calculation won't take into consideration. And what this can lead to is a scenario where people often can drastically underestimate their scanning requirements um, or overestimate the, the scanning capacity that they will have. So I think with, with all of this, it is have a realistic idea of what you need and what your scenario looks like. Um, so the first thing is know what you want to scan, and which might seem quite simple, but it's not necessarily every single slide that's produced in a lab. There may be different scenarios that you want to, to consider and then evaluate and quantify how long your slides take in your setting. Um, and then there is a balance to be made between what is your total scan time and what is your hands-on time. So what I mean by that is the hands-on time, things like do you have to physically load your slides into an auto loader? open doors on an instrument, put the slides in? Do you then manually have to go in and set up scan protocols or scan areas and review each each of the, the slides in turn? So what is that man hours um, equivalent or that you will need to, to put into operating this scanner? And then when you have those first three points of, of information, Check how this will fit into your working hours and your workflow. And is it something where you may want to consider adjusting shifts so there's a slightly earlier or a slightly later finishing time? Um, and then consider your scheduled and unscheduled downtime. So for, for all scanners out there, they're, they're going to have some level of routine maintenance requirements, whether that, that's weekly, monthly, whether that's to fit in with um, calibration testing or requirements for ISO or SOP standards. Um, so to try and take these things into to consideration. So coming back to that first point is really knowing what you want to have scanned. And is this something where you want to roll it out by application? I think very rarely we, we see a situation where 
people want to implement digital pathology, go from zero to 100% in one fell swoop. Um, so maybe these are things to consider is, is there a specific application or a workflow that you want to do it? Whether it's your multidisciplinary team meetings or tumor boards, you know, IHC review, second opinions, IOCs, um, a, a mixture of these, or is it to roll out by specialty or in a research scenario by a, a project type? You know, do you want to just look at a breast tissue, lung, prostate, liver, well, whatever it happens to be? And then from that, to look at, well, what slides do you have and what makes sense to scan? Because they're not necessarily the, the same thing. So the, the typicals would be your, your bright fields, your H&Es, your IHCs, special stains. Do you have all one by three slides or do you have some double slides? Your two by threes that you need to have scanned. And do you have any need for scanning fluorescence slides or fish slides? Um, so out of all those that maybe you create in your lab, which ones do you actually want to start scanning? Which ones make sense? To, to do and will actually give you a value back. So when you're looking at your scanners, as I mentioned earlier, evaluating the, the real throughput, um, and this really is one where, where size matters. So as mentioned, the industry standard is a 15 millimeter by 15 millimeter section, which comes in at 225 millimeters squared. Um, and the industry standard for scan time, I, I sometimes compare it to the automotive industry where car manufacturers will report the, the time for, for 0 to 60 for a car getting from 0 to 60 miles an hour as an industry standard. And similarly with scan speed, it is a mark of speed. It's something that's normalized to a standard, but it's not necessarily the full story. So from my experience, a real world average um, for scan areas is typically closer to between 500 and 600 millimeters squared. So two, two and a half times the, the industry standard for reporting scan time or scan speed. And then when you actually look at what scan time is, the, the 15 by 15 millimeter scan time is often this piece here. It's the, the part where your slide is under the objective lens and you're doing that high resolution scanning. However, what are we taking into consideration here? Do we take into consideration slide loading, which is your, your hands on time, somebody physically interacting with your with the slides and with the scanner? Is it a scan setup? identifying which slides are in the, your racks or your loaders, which ones do you want to scan? Are there different protocols that you'd like to scan at? What parts of the slide do you want to scan? And then once you have that part done, the slide moving. So actually taking your, your loaders or your racks and moving them around the, the instrument to get them to your scanning stage. Finding your regions of interest or your focus can be hands-on time or could be automated. So there's four steps before we even get to the actual scanning process. And then that scanning, does it include your macro image? Does it include scanning of your slide label or your barcode? And then your file saving or your processing um, portion that will come into play. And then on top of all of that, do you get failed slides? Do you need to rescan any of those? And then what impact does that have both on your workflow, but also on your throughput? So once you, you've kind of had a, a look at, at scan speed and throughput, I think some other criteria in your scanner selection um, is there can be an assumption that you will be keeping your scanner fed the whole time that this will be able to, to run constantly. So if you are going to keep your scanner fed, again, evaluating that throughput of slides and then figuring out who's actually going to do this, who's going to be available to load the slides. 
Um, and then will you have urgent cases? Are you going to have those priority, those stat cases that will be fly-ins that are largely unscheduled and unknown, but that absolutely need to be done straight away? And also, will your scanner work unattended? Is unattended scanning, batch scanning, overnight batch scanning uh, an option for you? Um, and when people are, are working out their calculations for scanners, quite often there can be an assumption that these scanners will run 100% of the time, effectively 24 seven or, or maybe kind of 24 five, depending on your, your lab hours. Um, and that's when you really need to look at, well, what are your standard lab working hours? Could these or will these change if you adopt digital pathology to allow a longer time for loading up those slides? And if your scanner will work unattended, maybe for overnight scanning, how many, how much of a, a full batch can your, slide, your scanner do overnight? So let's say just to highlight maybe some of the, the common pitfalls that uh, I've seen over the years. I say the first one is the reliance on the published scan speed. Um, and just a, a caveat emptor here, buyer beware, not all scan speed are measured equally. They say the assumption that the scanners will always be full and always be running and that your loading and unloading times need to be taken into consideration because that has a, a massive impact for the, the lab. You could have the fastest scanner on the market, but if it, it takes you know, 20 minutes to, to load it every time, then maybe your overall throughput is not going to be the fastest. And then the size of the tissue in your lab, your samples in your setting, is 15 millimeters by 15 millimeters representative? And if not, what impact does that have on your throughput calculations? And are you quantifying your rescan rates for your samples? The other one is that to just keep it in mind is potential mismatch between slide readiness and scanner readiness. So if you assume that maybe the, the lab starts at eight o'clock in the morning, your scanner has a capacity for 200, 300 slides. So somebody goes in the morning and they, they load the slides in. Well, actually, will you have those slides ready first thing in the morning at 8 a.m.? Or what is the schedule for your slides being ready throughout your day and then your scanner being ready to, to take those and to scan them? I think once you've looked at the, the scanner of interest, you've evaluated maybe the, the right one for you or what type of units you're looking for, then it comes to where will you locate this scanner? And once again, size matters. Ideally, the, the location should be located in the, the lab, close to your cover slipping, which is typically the, the last process before scanning um, and this helps to limit your your walk around your transit time transport of slides and obviously the the pitfalls that go with that about maybe potentially dropping slides trip hazards things like that and you know will this fit into your existing benches your infrastructure do you have the the power supply and you know the connectivity and the ports that you may require and then also to consider, does your preferred scanner have any special requirements? Um, you know, different scanners on the market may have sensitivity to vibrations. So you may need to put them into an area where they'll be free from vibrations or, or bumps or onto specialist tables. What level of, of noise or heat does your scanner generate? And is that going to be disruptive? Um, if you were to implement it in a lab environment. And also the, the weight of um, your scanner. Is this going to require a reinforced or, or a custom bench? Um, and the, the two visuals towards the right hand side here, the squares or the rectangles at, at the top, just give a, a visual overview 
um, on the difference in scale of some of the, the scanners on the, the market today. Um, and it, indeed with the, the weights at the bottom, the difference that you may have in weights of the instrument. And these have significant impact when you're trying to choose how and where your scanner could fit into your, your lab and to your workflow. Ultimately, I think what everybody is trying to get to is this type of lean layout. So to minimize the overlapping and re repetitive footfall as shown here on the, the left hand side and get to something that's a lot more streamlined and one directional um, throughout the, the workflow as shown here on the right. So as I say, let's have a, a look at, at the workflow as a whole within the, the lab, not just at the post cover slipping slide uh, side of things. So when we look at, at slides, it may require adopting digital may require changes to multiple steps within your lab workflow. So for instance, with your slide preparation, um, the optimal thickness for reviewing under a microscope or your normal lab standard, that might change to go to an optimal section thickness of kind of the, the three to four micron range. Um, and to lo locate the tissue centrally on the slide, keep it away from from edges keep it away from the edge of your cover slip with no overhangs of tissue all tissue within the cover slip area and to eliminate excess mounting media bubbles folds things that may be difficult for a, a scanner to scan and then one of the big questions is often well when to to qc your slides because if you are going to take them from cover slipping and into a scanner. There's a huge efficiency there of being able to take your slides out of your cover slipper straight into your scanner. It avoids double work of loading and unloading slides from one rack to another. Um, but how do you maintain your, your quality and do your assurance steps on that? Is it something then that you would do at the microtome? Um, and when do you QC the scanned slide? Um, do you automatically send it out or do you have somebody in the lab QCing the, the scanned slide for scan quality or is it the scanned slide for both scan quality as well as the, the slide preparation quality? You know, there's potential to automate some of these steps that may or may not be part of consideration with your workflow. And then also, if your lab does a block check, typically in your normal um, analog workflow, where are you going to bring that block check in? So then as you look at digital, again, digital may affect more than just your scanning of your slides, but moving away from handwritten or even human readable slides you know and the, the challenges that go with that as shown here on some of the, the slide cassettes um, and slide labels and really the impact of automation for me is again a, a ruler of thumb just for guidance purposes is that with less than 100 slides a day you can probably get away with a manual process of you know entering your, your data scanning your slides and manually doing um data entry there is obviously danger of data entry keystroke errors potential for for some double databasing in there um but really if you're going above and as i say this is a rule of thumb but above about 100 slides a day it becomes then mandatory that you're going to bring in barcoding that is going to allow you to automate this data transfer between your laboratory information system or laboratory information management system and your slides. So to help avoid this duplication and streamline that data transfer, which makes it trackable, makes it automated from a data flow perspective. So if all of these things go to, to plan and are thought through, well, what it can mean for the, the lab as well is that something 
uh, as arduous and time consuming as K sorting can go from something that looks like this to this. Automated based on barcodes, aggregation of your, your cases together and um, visible on screen for your reviewers. Similarly, your slide delivery can move from something like this of putting flats into to pigeonholes to this. Instant availability of your, your slides directly to the person who needs them when they need them. So I hope that has been a, a helpful insight into maybe some of the, the pitfalls and things to consider when implementing digital pathology. And if there are any questions, I would be very happy to take them now. Thank you very much.